That's all right. Huh? Thank you, Lord. There may still be a tiny little buzz in there, but I, I actually worked and got a lot of it out. There was a... Yeah, go ahead and check it. But it probably won't be perfect, but I think it's a lot better than it was. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. We have to check all this technical stuff out, making sure that everything is working so that people can hear us, right? Because there are people listening to us online, and uh, we want people to be able to hear us. Amen? Not hear us like we, like, you know. We want them to hear the word. Much better. It was a button that was pushed. Uh, anyway, I won't go there. <laughs> but, um, so, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, speak through the preacher today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. There's a book back there underneath that table. Most of you are aware of it, but it's called What Must We Do by John Kellogg. John has went to be with the Lord, but he walked into our coffee shop located at 104 Ninth Avenue North, <laughs> open at 8 o'clock in the morning for breakfast. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But he walked in the coffee shop, and uh, he was a, he's a gift from the Lord sent to me. And there's, listen, people, God will send people your way. Are you with me? He will, send, he will have divine appointments, and he will send people your way. And that's how it works, to connect you with certain people. Amen? To, to bring certain words into your life, because that's how the Holy Spirit works. He works through people. Amen? And the Lord brought John Kellogg in. And he, we spoke for a few minutes, and he majorly confirmed, really, a lot of what God had already been showing me and put in my heart, but he just really firmed it up. And it was, at that point, it had to, a lot to do with the rest of God. This was 2000, probably 11. Hmm. Interesting years, 2010, 11. But anyway... Before he left, we had a little meeting up in the coffee house. Before he left, he handed me this book called What Must We Do? And he said, take a look at this. And, of course, it's based upon, you know, that encounter that Jesus had with the Pharisees that said, what must we do to do the works of God? And Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe on the one that he sent. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, you know, several years ago, that was just like a lot of us were scratching our head. You know, like, what do you mean? There's got to be more to it than that. But now we understand we're being established in the grace of God, and we understand that it's really all about what Christ has already done. Amen? It's never, listen, it's never about what we have a do for God. It's really all about what God, because of his great love for us, intended to do for us in Jesus to reconcile us back into his loving arms. Amen? So, I'm showing you this because this is, this is the direction we're going today. Okay? And um, it's really about get, being delivered from all this doing and coming into the freedom of looking and seeing the truth that it's all about what God has always wanted to do for us and how that God has always wanted to serve us serve us yes I said God has always wanted to serve us with his life and his love but one of the last acts of Jesus before he went to the cross to lay down his life was he took a towel he stooped down and he washed their feet and he says, if I'm your Lord and teacher, if I'm your rabbi, if I'm the one that you are listening to, then you will seek no position higher than this, than a foot washer, because the kingdom of God is all about serving. Amen? It's all about allowing God to serve us first, and then us being equipped then to serve others, out of us allowing Jesus to wash our feet Amen? 
And guess what? The Word is still washing our feet today. He's still washing us from the, the things of the world. We walk out there, the feet, everywhere they go, they pick up things, right? And the Word is still, if we'll allow Him to wash our feet on a continual basis. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, you know, you're in the world, but not of it, but you're going to pick up things. I mean, things are pressed in on you all the time. And that's why we desperately need to not understand the power of the washing of the Word of God. He says, continue in my Word. There's a reason he said that. <laughs> Amen. Continue to receive the engrafted, implanted Word that's able to wash your soul. Save your soul. Amen. And so. But the Lord. He's what he's wanting us. And, and we are being more and more step. But how do you know we need to continue to hear the word. No matter how often we've heard it. We need to continue to hear it. Peter said this right before his departure. He says. Even though you've heard these things. And are even established in these things. And think you know these things. And are established in these things. And I will continue. But he says, I will still continue to remind you of these things. Why? Because we need to know these things. Amen? We need to continue to receive this word of truth and the wisdom of the Lord that keeps us focused in the right direction. Amen? Keeps us healed. But I want to read this what this this first uh, chapter real quick because this is where we're going on this what must I do the way of doing introduced it is he says in considering most of any subject it's usually a good thing to begin at the beginning so in our present hold on a second hold on hold on let me back up now I got to back up the introduction. This is where I, the introduction in this book's even good. This is where I want to be. He says, "I recently heard a song on a Christian recording that went something like this: When it's all been said and done, there is just one thing that counts." This is a Christian song on the radio. There's only one thing that counts: Did I live my life for you? It seems to me that this song expresses the ever-recurring, though generally unspoken, question that plagues most Christians. Am I living a life that is pleasing to God? I mean, you know, a lot of people are living by the am I doing enough to please God, when they should be living by the I am righteous in Christ. Amen? I am complete, not by the am. Am I, but the I am, right? Certainly, godliness in our external daily life is the desire of every Christian, and rightly so, for it is clearly called for in scriptures. But how many of you know we have received everything that we need for life and godliness? It's already been deposited within us. Amen? So it's not a matter of doing it, it's a matter of it being just manifest within our lives. We've received everything. The key to the Christian life is knowing that you're complete in Christ. The key to the Christian life and seeing the life of God manifest in your life is not you trying to live the Christian life, but it's Christ who now lives his life in me. Amen? And, and the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? I don't frustrate the grace of God by trying to live it. By that, acknowledge everything that God says is true about who I am in Christ and, and the fullness of God that God has. Our, listen, I used to be full of it. Now I'm full of God. Amen? God wants you to know that you are filled with the fullness of God. Of his fullness you have received. You can't get any more complete or full of God than what you already are. Now, your feelings may feel, well, I don't feel very full. Well, what are you going to agree with, your feelings or the Word of God? <laughs> Amen? But there's a lot of Christians that are, listen, receiving the wrong gospel. That's based on, uh, uh, their focus is more on what they do for God 
than what God in Christ has already done for them. But you won't manifest fruit. Fruit will, you will not bear fruit until you know who you're joined to. You can try and produce fruit all your life. Amen? You might squeeze out a little joy and peace every now and then. But you will never bear the fruit of the Lord that glorifies the Lord. Amen? Until you rest in the vine. Until you rest in the finished work of Jesus. I mean, you know, God's the one that gives the increase. And God doesn't tell us to produce fruit. He says, you'll bear fruit. As long as you acknowledge who you're attached to, you abide in the vine, which means that's where you live. That's what you're in, who you're engrafted into. Those that have been married to the Lord, amen, have become one with Jesus, amen. And he says we, we've been married to Christ so that we may bear fruit of the Lord, amen, to the glory of the Lord. The big question is this how can i get my daily life to express the godliness that both the lord and i desire i'm just i'm just telling you where a lot of people are in their minds how can i get this to happen because this is such a central issue in the lives of most christians there has come an avalanche of how to books follow the money <laughs> How-to books on the subject. Every Christian bookstore has a generous supply of such book. The five steps to a God-pleasing life. The seven steps. And they sell big, right? The seven steps to a powerful prayer life. All of them are presented with an honest desire to help the struggling Christians do a better job of showing forth the righteousness he desires to express. But unfortunately, most of these books offer results that are based on a greater discipline and a renewed effort on the part of the believer. And so eventually all of the, their roads lead back to Romans 7, where the weary traveler, I even hear this song on the radio, weary traveler, can only sigh and say, here I am again, Lord. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. This tension between a righteousness of my own based on law of self-effort and the righteousness from God that depends on faith brings a frustration that underlines the lives of ever so many Christians. They know that their salvation is by faith in the shed blood of Jesus. And they rejoice in that. But from then on, they live as though they're continuing right standing before God. And their daily acceptance by him depends on what they do or don't do. When asked how they feel about the Christian life, the answers that come almost universally are, Well, I should be praying more. I should be reading my Bible more. <laughs> I should be giving more. Or I should be witnessing more. Why is this? Where does this strong feeling of a need to be doing something for God come from? And is this doing what way really what God desires from us? It came from the wisdom of the serpent. Amen? All the doing, all the, all the focus on self where you are the main point of reference. Am I doing enough for God? It's never been about what you do for God. It's about what God in Christ has done for you. And now what he's doing in you and through you. For it is God who works in you. Remember this. You didn't begin a good work for God. God began a good work in you. And he is well able to complete the work that he began. Amen? In fact, it's already a done deal. Amen? God is working in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Let God do his work. Amen? Praise God. Let's don't frustrate the grace of God. So, the fallen mindset of religion in the world is always to look to the strength of the flesh, right? Through sheer willpower and discipline and determination to achieve righteousness and clothe himself with life. 
It always wants to look to its own wisdom and understanding, even when interpreting scriptures. I command that clock to stop in the name of Jesus. I feel your pain, sister. <laughs> Or I could say, like, you know, um, uh, remember Lot's wife, don't look back. <laughs> so, John six twenty seven through 29, he says, Jesus says to the Pharisees, Do not labor for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man, listen to this, will give you. It says he will give you this life. Amen? He knows that, listen, how many you know Jesus was the only one in his right mind in the earth? And he knew every mind that he was talking to was, was um, captivated or enslaved by this way of doing. What do we do? What do we do? And he knew, hey, I didn't come. Listen, he says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. He's talking to the carnal mind. He's talking to that mind captured by sin and darkness. It's all, he, Jesus is saying, it's, listen, it's never about you serving God first. It's about me serving you. It's about God serving you. Amen? And the carnal mind will have a lot of, e even like a lot of whatever. Sometimes you've got to go through a little detox, amen, with this. Because the carnal mind will rage up and say, what do you mean? We're not supposed to do anything for God? And they'll start arguing and throwing a fit, right? And that's not worth saying. Just chill out. Chill out, amen? There are good works, but they flow out of the finished work, Amen? The good works actually flow out of you resting in the finished work of Jesus. That's the only way good works will flow. Everything else is going to be a dead work. All the toiling, striving, and you trying to live for God and serve God. Amen. It's all going to burn up. It's all going to burn. We don't want, to, we don't want uh, wood, hay, and stubble, do we? We want just the works that are, are a result of the... The fruit of the Spirit, right. right? The Holy Spirit. And come out of that finished work. Right. And so they said to him in verse 28. Well, first, let me just finish this. He says, the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Mm -hmm. I love that. <sighs> You'll be, you, he says, I'm going to give you life because the life is in the Son. And the Father has set his seal on him. Amen? And he says this, They said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. Okay? Thank you, Lord. We're just going where the Holy Spirit led us to go today. Is that okay? And, you know, when you said Pentecost Sunday, I had kind of, I'm sorry, I mean, I would forgotten it was Pentecost Sunday. But the Lord gave me a lot of scriptures about the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? Because he says, you know what? The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life, first of all. And then he says, the carnal mind will get it wrong every time. That's why we have 32,000 denominations. <laughs> Amen? But how many know there's only one faith? There's only one truth. There's only one Lord. There's really only one truth. Amen? And guess who knows that truth? The Spirit of Truth. And guess where the Spirit of Truth lives? He lives in you. Jesus says, he, I'll be with you, but he's going, the Holy Spirit is soon to be in you, this spirit of truth, and he will lead you and guide you into the truth. Amen. That's his word. Amen? But we have to not 
lean, learn not to lean to our own understanding, right? And he's directed me, he's, he's directed me to the scriptures too, in understanding and seeing the truth in the scripture, right? We can interpret the scripture through our, I mean, we can interpret the scripture through our own understanding. Well, what do you think it says? Well, what do you think it says? Well, I think it says this. Well, I think it says it. Well, you know what? Who cares what you think? Are you all with me? It's not about what you think. It's about what the Holy Spirit illuminates us to see what is true. Amen? So, John says in John 14, 25 through 26, Jesus said, these things have I spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Isn't that awesome? The Holy Spirit even directed me in this message today because he said, I want him to know some things about me. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Amen? How I many you know the Holy Spirit was sent and he lives in you? Amen? But like that, we were looking at, it was uh, 1 Corinthians 2. He says, you have the mind of Christ. But 1 Corinthians 3, right, the next chapter, he says, but I couldn't speak to you as spiritual, but as carnal. So how many you know the, the, the believer, the Christian, can have the Holy Spirit have the mind of Christ, but still walk in the carnal mind. It's all through Scripture. Paul addressed a lot of churches about their carnality and the fruit of the carnality. Amen? And he says, listen, the solution is the mind of Christ, is to knowing who you are in Christ and knowing whose you are and knowing who lives in you. But he says the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. He's a teacher. And bring things to your remembrance. In other words, the Lord's saying, I want you, I'm sending the helper. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. The same one that led me and guided me is going to be in you and guide you. Same, not a different spirit. Same Holy Spirit. And then in John 14, 15, through 18, he says, if you love me, keep the Ten Commandments. No, he didn't say that, did he? I thought I'd throw that out, see where you were. <laughs> but how many of you know that's how we read it? A lot of people. They read it, if you love me, keep the 612 commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. No, he's saying, yes, he's saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. But how many of you know the commandments are not the... Big Ten or the 613, but First John 3.23, he says, And this is my commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son of Jesus and love one another as he gave us commandment. And where does love begin? It love begins with us first receiving the love that God has for us. So the commandment of the Lord is to believe in Jesus and receive his love. Amen? Trying to make it simple here. <laughs> the Lord, the Lord, the Lord showed me. Uh, you revealed this to me last week. Not, but just confirmed it again. But He says, you know, the message is simple. He says, it's the simplicity that's in Christ. Don't let anyone move you away from the simplicity that's in Christ. The message is the simplicity that's in Christ. And that message is, as he is, so are you. Is Christ righteous? Are you in Christ? Then you're righteous. Is Christ holy? Then you're holy. Why? Because it's not about what you do. It's about who you're in. Don't let anyone move you away from the simplicity of the finished work. 
of your identity in Christ, the simplicity that's in Christ. You have the message of the simplicity that's in Christ, and then you all have all the other carnal messages. That's it. Once you move away from the simplicity in Christ, you're off somewhere else. You have the simplicity then in Christ, then you have 32,000 denominations. Amen? And God's bringing it back to the simplicity that's in Christ. And it's not about what we do. It's about what Christ has already done and what he's now doing in us. And Jesus says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Everyone say forever. forever. And then he says, this, this helper is called the spirit of truth. How many of you know if there is any time we need the, the spirit of truth and we need to lean on the spirit of truth, it's now. Amen? That's why, you know, some, and listen, people can do what they want, but the Lord told me a couple years ago, I want you to turn off some stuff because it has no, no counsel to give to you. It has nothing to give you. The only thing it's going to do if you take it in and listen to it is cause... A fog fog and confusion in the way you see things are you with me and I don't want the fog amen I want the Sun <laughs> praise God so he says the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him and he dwells with you and will be in you everyone say in you he says, he will be in you. The Holy Spirit will be in you. Amen. And then he says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> you know, if Jesus says, I'm coming to you, amen, he's coming. It's a promise. And he did come. And he didn't leave us orphans because the main thing the Holy Spirit cries out, right, is Abba, Father. He wants us to understand that God is our Father, that we're not orphans in this world. Amen? But we are, in fact, the children of God. Amen. So he says in John fifteen twenty six, But when the Helper comes, fifteen twenty six, John, When the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father... Then he says this again, the spirit of truth. I love that. He kept, he, he kept illuminating that to me. It's the spirit of truth. Who proceeds from the Father, he will, what will he do? He will testify of me. In other words, how do you know it's the spirit of truth that's teaching you and directing you? Because he will always point to Jesus. And to the testimony of Jesus. Amen? He will always testify of me and what I came to do for you. Not what you do for me, but what I came to do for you. Jesus, help us. Listen, if you go to a place and hear a gospel and it's all centered around about you and what you need to do for Jesus, you better run. It's not the spirit of truth. Are you with me? Yeah, it appeals to the flesh. Amen? To that lust of the flesh. But the spirit of truth will always point to Christ. Amen. What about good works? Don't worry about the good works. The works will come. Amen? The works will come. As you set your affection on Jesus. And he says in John sixteen thirteen. However... Again, he says, John 16, 13, However, when the Spirit of truth, everyone say the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. The Spirit of truth, he will guide us into all truth. Why is this so important? Because, listen, in the world, you have a lie. And then you have the truth. <laughs> it's pretty simple, isn't it? You're either believing the truth or you're believing a lie. And the lie can be 
really clothed as truth. Right? The lie can be clothed as sincerity, just like the serpent came to Adam and Eve in the garden. But you have the Holy Spirit of truth in you. And he will testify of Jesus. And I'm telling you, the spirit of truth will always point to the finished work of Jesus, to the death, burial, and resurrection of, G of Jesus. Amen? And the spirit of truth will, will tell you, listen, it will point to Jesus, the one who took our sin. Amen? Who put to death all sin and all death in his body, who was buried, who was raised from the dead. Amen. By the Father. And forever lives sitting at the right hand of the Father. And the spirit of truth will tell you that you are no longer alive to sin. You are dead to sin. You are dead to the law. You are dead to death. And you are now alive in Christ forevermore. That's the spirit of truth. Amen. Amen. And listen, I, I love this because this message, I know the gospel. It's simple. But this is the message, amen, this is the message that has the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it. And this is the message, the only message that will persuade your heart in the right direction. Because God has taken out of you a heart of stone. Remember that in Ezekiel? I'm taking out of them a heart of stone, which means that heart that thinks it's all about them and what they do for God. And what they build for God. If you look at that word stone, it's build. It's what we do. It's what we build. God is taking away that heart of stone and giving you a heart of flesh. And that word flesh literally means a heart that's receptive to the good news. I know what God has done. He's put a heart in you that's receptive to the gospel, receptive to the good news. Why? Because he loves us so much, he wants us to believe the truth, amen, and be transformed into the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. And he's the, I love that, that message that Beulah preached about conformed or transformed. If you haven't listened to it, go on our website at goodnewsmyrtlebeach.com. Listen to it. Because it's, it's right on point in what we're talking about. To be con he says, don't be conformed to the world, right? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word conform implies you do something to, to change yourself after a certain pattern or, or external way uh, or thing. That it, but it's you. It's conformed. You would think, you know, we've been taught conformed to the world is, oh, it just means don't hang around with people that are doing yucky stuff. I mean, you know, that's not what it means at all. Conformed to the world, at, in, in, even in that context, he's talking about don't be like the religious folks. Don't be like the Pharisees because there's a religious world out there that look to the flesh, amen, and through self-determination and willpower and toil and labor are trying to become, to transform themselves by their flesh. You understand what I'm saying? It's kind of like, I'm going to get in trouble with this one. I don't care. What would Jesus do is being conformed to the world? Don't get quiet on me. Because what would Jesus do is trying to figure out what would Jesus do and then me look into my flesh to try and pattern myself after what Jesus would do. That what it, that's what it means to be conformed to the world. And when you do that, guess what? The transformation pro process that God wants to do in your life is frustrated. And it gets people stuck in trying to do and trying to live and trying to be. And guess what? There's no fruit. There's no maturity. No real maturity. It's not what would Jesus do. It's what did Jesus see. 
And what did Jesus believe? Are y'all with me? Conform. Don't be conformed. Stop trying. Stop trying to, through your own self-will and determination, be like Jesus. Stop trying to do that. And instead, rest and know that you're already like him. Didn't he say if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things have become new and all things are now of the Lord. And it's really about right beholding as you behold the glory of the Lord as in a mirror. Amen. The transformation takes place not by your flesh, but by the spirit of the Lord. Conformed is about what you try to do to make it happen. Transformation is what is done to you. Are you with me? It's something that is being done in you and to you. To where you like, you're just sitting at the feet of Jesus receiving his word. And you're agreeing with what God says is true about who you are in Christ. And all of a sudden, a lot of things you used to struggle with, you're no longer struggling with them. And you're going, what's going on here? It's called transformation. Amen? By the Spirit of God. You start loving people that you never thought you could ever love. And it's not you trying to love people. Amen? It's just the fruit of God's love is being manifest within your life. I've got about two more hours here. But, man, I could go. I feel your pain. <laughs> Praise God. But I've got to get to the, the one of the main things that the Lord showed. That means I have to just scroll on down. Thank you, Lord. Well, maybe this was all for me. I like, I like in Romans 12, uh, 1, 2, and we've already quoted it, but I like... Uh, Young's literal translation. It says, I call upon you, therefore, brethren, through the compassion of God, to present your bodies a sacrifice, living, sanctified, acceptable to God, which is your intelligent service. <laughs> and this says intelligent, and he says this, Listen, one of the smartest, most intelligent things you could ever do, amen, in this world, is to agree with what God, who God says you are in Christ. One of the most unintelligent things is to fight against that. Amen? Is to agree with your feelings or whatever. We all got feelings, amen? But it doesn't matter. Our feelings will swing. Things happen. We get pressed upon. But who we are in Christ will never change. And God says the most intelligent thing you can do is to present yourself to God holy, complete, righteous, and fully acceptable in his eyes. Not based on your performance, not based on your perfect behavior, but based upon Christ's perfect finished work. Amen? When he says it's finished. And you are complete in him. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Transformed is what happens to you simply by receiving the word of truth. That's why the word is so important. If, oh. Listen. If you, you, if you don't have an appetite for the word, you need to get one. Amen. Come on now. Amen? I'm telling you. Because nothing else will transform your life except the word of God. Amen. And if you're not receiving the word of God on a continual basis, then what you're doing is being conformed to the world. Amen. Because you're saying, I got this. Yeah. I can do it. No, you can't. The only thing that will transform you is the word of God that you receive. And Jesus said to, to Martha, Mary has chosen the one thing needed. 
and it will not be taken away from her. Amen. Amen. And Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, receiving the engrafted the word of God. And that word was working in her to transform her from the inside out. So the Lord brought this to my attention about a segment in this, The Chosen, where Mary Magdalene, she's on the street, and she's, she has just been delivered, right? And Nicodemus sees her on the street. And he's shocked because the last time he saw her, she was totally bound, right, by the devil and darkness. But she shock, he's shocked because he sees this transformation in Mary Magdalene, that she's just got this countenance on her that's just totally changed. And he co comes up to her. He comes up to her and says, he says, You're ch is that really you? You're, ch you're so changed. And he's trying to, he's, he thinks it's about what he did. Nicodemus says, well, you know, I was there and, I, you know, I know God probably used me to help you, you know, bring about the change. And she says this, it was absolutely nothing, had nothing to do with you or what you did. <laughs> All I know, he called my name. And I ran out of the grave. <laughs> she didn't say that, but are you with me? All I know. She says this, all I know is I was one way, but now I'm another. Yeah. And what happened in between was him. The word yeah. brought the transformation. Yeah. That's so powerful. And I can say that I, I cried when I, I, the, Lord, the Holy Spirit brought that to my attention because I know that's true. It has nothing to do with I've, what I've done or any religious institution. It's all about the Lord. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I was one way, and now I'm another. Right. And what happened in between was him, <laughs> was Jesus. Yeah. So I want to close, getting close to closing. <laughs> Brother, I'm going to be courteous, okay? I don't want to wear out the saints of the Most High. But the word is good. I could literally go on for another hour. Because there's so much in this. That we need to understand and learn. But. The one thing that the Lord. Continued to bring back. To my attention in this message. Was when. The Apostle Paul referred to himself. As the chief of sinners. Okay. And in 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 17, he says this. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. It wasn't to condemn sinner. Amen. It was to save sinners. Amen. And he says, of who I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me, first, Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. In other words, Paul was saying, listen, if Jesus can save me, he can save anyone. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And what he was saying when... When he was, when he said, "I'm chief," I was chief sinner. He he wasn't saying, "I was like you know Leroy Brown, baddest man in the whole <laughs> town." <laughs> I wasn't the chief drinker, you know, all the yucky behavior. I was, you know, when he said, "I was the chief sinner," of whom I'm chief, he was saying. I I was chief if there was anyone that was depending on his flesh for righteousness and to clothe himself with life through religion and self-effort and sweat and determination, I win the prize. Right? That's what he's saying. I'm, the chief sinner was the one that was trying to, to con 
to uh, transform himself. Thank you. Thank you, brother. And then we could go into Philippians that says, listen, how many know Philippians 3 talks about, he gives his resume of all the things he, he was. I mean, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He thought it was about his bloodline and about, you know, um, his pedigree, right? And thought it was about what he did. I mean, he did it all. But he says, listen, after I met Jesus on that road to Damascus and the resurrected Lord, and he communicated his love to me, he says, I know it's just all about him and what he's done for me. Amen? And so I take all those works and all those, that self-effort of me trying to become, trying to do, trying to achieve, and I throw it in the burn barrel. Right? And it's nothing. It's all about knowing him and the power of his resurrection. Amen? And that's what it's about. It's about relationship. And it's not, and we didn't go into it, but it really has nothing to do, this whole Bible. How many know the entire Bible, the volume of the book, Jesus says, was written about me. So we were talking earlier, when you go into the old, Holy Spirit's going to show you Jesus. It's Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. Amen? And God, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He didn't change. He's not like a different God in the old. In the, and he's had one plan. Amen? Only one plan all through. And this plan is Jesus. <laughs> and he says, the volume of the book is written in me, Hebrews 10, to do your will. And Jesus saw this. Jesus is reading the scripture and he says, hey, this book is about me. <laughs> when he looked at the law of Moses, he said, hey, this is all about me. It's not about all the sacrifices and all this stuff. He says, it's about the ultimate sacrifice. And a body that you have prepared for me. I've come to do your will. To take away the first and establish the last. It was all about him. But people's minds were blind to the truth. And the scriptures. After his resurrection, Jesus had a Bible study. Didn't he? With the disciples who were locked behind closed doors. He says, he just suddenly appears. I love Jesus. He suddenly appears and he says, hey, y'all got something to eat? <laughs> He's in his resurrection. Glory. Y'all got something to eat? And then, he, and then he opens the scriptures. Not only does he, listen to this. This is important. Not only does he open the scripture, but he opens their understanding. He opens their mind to understand and to comprehend the scriptures in which they had no idea what it really said. And listen to this. Neither do we without the Holy Spirit. You can say, well, you know, I think it says this. I th you need to just burn all that stuff. Are you with me? I love what Greg said the other day in, in a uh, study. He says... He says, contradiction is the birthing place for revelation. In other words, when you see contradiction, don't get frustrated. Just rest. Amen? There's something to see there that you're not seeing. It's the birthing place for revelation. Amen? And we've all, we've been in studies. Amen? Let's just chill out. Amen? And give sometimes we're just so quick oh we got to figure it out we got to understand it we got to calm down amen? amen and let the Holy Spirit of truth reveal the truth to us but it says he opened up their understanding to comprehend that the scripture was all about Jesus and then he told the Pharisees says you search the scriptures because in searching them you think 
you have eternal life by your rigorous study. I'm, I'm, I'm achieving, I've read through the Bible in a year. I'm sure God is pleased with me. <laughs> it ain't about that. He said, you search the scripture thinking that you have eternal life, but the scriptures were speaking of me. And you refuse to come to me for life. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the simplicity that's in Christ. Amen? And guess what? We're all in the same boat together. Amen? We're all in the same boat. It's about Jesus. It's about what God came to do to serve us with his life. Amen? And it's really about us receiving the gift, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace and then the word, the word works in you. So things in life don't reign over you, but you begin to reign in life through Jesus. And it's not you trying to reign and trying to figure it out. <laughs> Are you with me? All of a sudden, you're equipped. You're being equipped. You're being strengthened. You're, you're flourishing. The fruit of God's Spirit is increasing in your life, and you know it's not you. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. <laughs> and it says, and I like you did this, Lisa, one time with the communion, because on the road to, to Emmaus, right, that whole, it, uh, it's such powerful. But he has the Bible study with those guys on the road to Emmaus, and he begins to explain the scripture and show them where he is in the scripture but it's when it's when he was in the house and he and he broke the bread that their eyes popped open to who he was and then he disappeared <laughs> i love jesus <laughs> he goes boom <laughs> uh, Tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. <laughs> Just look at your neighbor. And tell me. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your body that was broken for us. You took our sin. You took death, sin in your body. You put it to death once and for all. The veil has been torn. We have full access into your presence and your presence is in us lord we thank you lord for your presence we thank you for the holy spirit of truth that lives in us lord that reminds us of these things that's bringing illumination and understanding to us concerning the word and we do this in remembrance of you amen Lord, we thank you for your blood that was shed for us. Thank you, Lord. We're a new creation in Christ. We've been forgiven once and for all. Amen. Forgiven of all sin. And are now in complete right union with you. You are our life. I want you to say this. Christ is my life. One of the most powerful things you can say is, Christ is my life. Christ is my life. Thank you, Lord. In you, we live and move and have our being. We do this in remembrance of you. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the word today. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that lives in us. I love this. You poured out your spirit upon all flesh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that we're not alone. Thank you for the comforter. Thank you for the teacher. Thank you for your presence and the manifestation of your presence and your spirit and your power. Thank you, Lord, that others might, might believe, just like Paul says, you chose me so that others would believe.
so that your presence would be manifest in and through me so that others would believe. So that others would believe. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bless you guys.